let's take our Bibles tonight and let's open to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel 15. You know, I, I really, I really had intended to have a shorter message, and I, I did my best. I did my best. So, so we're going to define shorter message. Just imagine that it's an associate pastor preaching tonight, and so then it'll seem like a shorter message, right? Amen? All right, so once we finish the shorter message, I'd like to be able to invite you to be a part of a prayer time uh, right here in the uh, uh, the new sanctuary, the Family Life Center. And so we're going to have our children, they'll be able to go to the art room with Brother Anthony Iomi. Teenagers can come up here to the bleachers with Brother Matt Wendell. And then so we'll be able to spread out, we'll be able to use the um, Patriot Cafe and then the other part of the bleachers. And if we're able to spread out good enough, we'll go ahead and, and have prayer time here and then we'll close together in prayer uh, a few minutes after that. Second Samuel 15. Keys to family closeness. What is the number one problem in the world today? Well, mankind is in rebellion against God. That includes you, that includes me, your mate, your children, your parents. The only way to solve the rebellion problem is to get a new heart. And how do you get a new heart? You turn your life over to Jesus Christ and receive him as Lord and Savior. How many have ever heard the Unshackled radio series? Yep. Right. Wonderful stories of God coming and changing a heart and changing a life. And so I want us to see these keys to family closeness because the single most important ingredient in order for a family to be close is to have their hearts knit together. And so Solomon said it this way. He said, my son, give me thine heart in Proverbs 23, 26. Now, God desires the hearts of parents and children and grandparents to be close. The only valid reason to separate the closeness of a family is when someone rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ. Matthew 10, 35. Our love for God is to be so greater that in comparison to family love, it would appear to be hate. Now, last week we saw how David lost the heart of his son Absalom. Absalom's full blood sister was hurt, and David did nothing but get mad. And so we, we went through the account. There was the assault by Amnon, and uh, David, David allowed Tamar, his daughter, who was the half-brother to Amnon, to be alone with Tamar, and he assaulted her. It was lust, not love. You've heard of overprotective parents? Well, David leaned the other way. He was an underprotective parent, not enough protection. And that brought us to the reaction by David. Uh, anger, but no action. David was angry when he heard what happened, but he took no action. And that brought about the rebellion by Absalom. He wanted vengeance, not justice. So two years later, Absalom killed Amnon as revenge for his sister's assault. And that led to the, uh, the rift between David and Absalom. Three years in exile, Absalom returned home. Two years later, he said, I want to see my father. If he wants to kill me, then let him kill me. But I want to see my father. And David and Absalom, they met. They kind of put a Band-Aid on the problem, but it really didn't fix it. You see, if you have cancer and you put a Band-Aid on it, it doesn't do any good. It doesn't solve the problem. Only genuine repentance, only genuine forgiveness will restore broken relationships. David finally saw Absalom, but not as a father. He saw him as a monarch on a throne. You know, when children see parents as just, when children see parents as being fair, the children are more likely to give their hearts to them. When David took no action against Amnon, Absalom saw his father as unjust, and he took matters into his own hands. And we saw the principles of Malachi 4, 6 and Luke chapter 1. And David unknowingly, he unknowingly planted a seed of rebellion in his son's heart. And now we come to 2 Samuel 15, and we see that seed grows up, and it blows up. Absalom became an outward rebel. What was in his heart, it finally, it finally came out. He plotted, and he carried out his plan to take his father's throne. Would you please stand with me as I read the opening six verses of 2 Samuel 15, 
verses 1 to 6. And it came to pass after this, after that meeting that, that David and Absalom had, and it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man a deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said moreover, Oh, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, that I would do him justice. And it was so, that when any man came near to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. May we pray. Lord, I, I ask that you might give every mom and dad and grandma and grandpa, brother and sister, every teenager, every child, a desire in our heart to be able to love you, to love our family, to love others. Help us to be patient. Help us to be forbearing over past offenses and conflicts. Help us to be selfless. Help us to be a part of uh, the solution and not the problem when it comes to family closeness. Now give us wisdom from your word. Lord, help us not just to hear it, but to practice it, to live it, to be filled with the Spirit of God that when your Holy Spirit prompts our human spirit, that we will say yes to you and obey you. I pray that this would spread around our area and city and country for so many, so many don't have mom and a dad that loves them. They don't have family members that care for them. But they could be the first one to bring the light of Christ to others. So God, give us passion and zeal to reach the lost. Even this week, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. It's very interesting. Absalom did to the men of Israel what he apparently wished David, his father, would have done for him. How did Absalom steal the hearts of the people? Well, it's the same way that we build a relationship with our kids. And so three keys to gain and to keep your child's heart. The first one is by talking. By talking. It came to pass, verse 1, that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men. He rose up early. He stood beside the way of the gate. It was so when any man came with a controversy. Absalom called unto him, said, What city are you from? Verse 3, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. So he is talking taking time to talk. Absalom made himself available to listen to the people. He took time for them. You know, uh, one survey I, I read said that, that the average dad spends eight minutes a day in talking with his son or daughter. Eight minutes. Having your child's heart starts out so easy. They want to be with you. But as time goes on, you have to work at it. You have to stay consistent at it. When your children are young, uh, you need to be there for them. To have routines that they can count on. I mean, a meal time and a devotion time and a church time and a bedtime. And as they get older, you have to be more intentional about it. You need to be there for their events, whether it's sports or recitals or plays or school programs. And grandparents, you can do the same. Be a part of their life. You make it a priority because they are a priority to you. And if you don't talk to your kids, if you don't teach your kids, someone else will. Three keys to gaining and keeping your child's heart by talking. Secondly, by listening. Verse 4. In verse 4, And Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and, 
and I, I would do him justice. Absalom says, if any man would come to me, I would listen to him. I would understand him. I would do him justice. I will take care of him. I'll listen. That's what he says. I'll listen. And we find that back in, in, um, in verse 2 as well. If you don't listen to your kids, someone else will. This listening thing is hard for dads and moms to do. Uh, when when, when they're, they're little, and we have a, a little one in the, in the house now as Jeremy and Katie move back from Guam, you, know, you try so hard to get them to talk, and you want that first word to be papa, right? <laughs> that, that should be the first word that they say, papa. Uh, but someone else in the house is trying to get Katie to say, Dad, and someone else is trying to get him to say mommy, and someone else is trying to get him to say mama. We try so hard, uh, and uh, I, I, I think it is pop pop. I, I think that's what's happening. But, but what happens is you try so hard to get him to talk, and then, and then after a while, it starts picking up steam, and they really start talking. And, and then they're walkie talkie, and, and they're talking, and all of a sudden, now sit down and be quiet, you know? <laughs> And, and, and then, then they're, they're like three and four, and you want to start finishing their sentences for them. And, and then they get into the elementary years, and uh, questions, questions. There is, there is a man in this auditorium that in 20 minutes, he asked me 42 questions. It's like, ah, you know, why this and why that? And, and I, I remember driving to skip back, and we're slowing down because there was a, a, a big branch on the road, and and uh, no, no, it wasn't. It was just slowing down. And I couldn't see at that point. And, and I knew it was going to be the question. Well, why are we slowing down? Uh, and uh, I don't know. Why don't you know why we are slowing down? Because <laughs> I'm not omniscient. And so you go through the why questions. And then you get back to the middle years and the junior high years. And, and then it's back to uh, finishing their sentences again. Because you know what they're going to say. And then they get to the 14, 15, 16, 17. And if you haven't been listening and talking... You're going to get that very common, yeah, whatever. Yeah, whatever. What happened? You have to be listening all the way through. Listening all the way through. Bedtime, meal time, devotion time. Uh, I encourage you to, to I, in the past, to download that app, Conversation Starters. Make every day count. If you did, you got it, you'll have it. If you didn't, uh, you lost your opportunity. It's no longer available. But if you did, you got it. You have to look for ways to engage in conversation. Three keys to gain and keep your child's heart. By talking, by listening, and by touching. By touching. Verse 5. And it was so that when any man came near to him to do him obedience, he put forth his hand and he took him and he kissed him. Yes, Absalom talked. Yes, Absalom listened. Yes, he also touched. And for years, these citizens who used to be loyal to David, I mean for decades, but now their hearts are being pulled away. Someone who will talk to them, someone who will listen to them, someone who will appropriately touch them and make a personal connection. And how many dads, how many dads are afraid to give affection? Hey, it's time to change. Verse 6, by talking, by touching, by listening. Absalom stole, ver, verse 6. And on this manner, what manner? Listening, talking, touching. On this manner did Absalom do to all of Israel and came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Before this chapter ends, David is running for his life from his own son who had taken the throne in Jerusalem from his own dad. Now the key, the key ingredient in raising godly children is to get their hearts early, uh, to be able to keep their hearts and be extre extremely vigilant not to lose their hearts. But if you do lose a child's heart, then you quickly find out where and when you lost it and you begin an action plan to get that heart back. And it might take years, it might even take decades. The question is, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to make the investment? How much time or money or trouble are you willing to take to get the heart of your child? You must decide if you're willing to pay the price. 
It might cost you financially. It might cost you your current job. It might require selling your home and going to more affordable housing, relocating. It might require radical changes in your personal lifestyle. Are you willing to pay the price? God already knows if you are. He knows if you are. He knows if you love your child enough, if you're willing to pay the price to deal with disobedience and rebellion. So let's take a look here. Some observations about building family closeness. Understand that rebellion originates in the heart. At the heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. Rebellion is is more a heart problem than an outward life problem. What we see happening across the country, it started in the heart. The problem David had was that he lost Absalom's heart. Absalom wandered away from God because he had a heart that wandered. Now, now the physical heart controls everything in a person's life. It's our, our spiritual heart, our emotional center, our soul. Uh, there's no more vital organ in your body than your heart. If you had a choice to have a damaged leg, a damaged arm, or a damaged heart, uh, you're not going to choose the heart because it, it, it sustains all the functions of your body. You need a healthy heart uh, to be able to continue to live. And a parent who has his child's heart will learn what is going on in their child's life. A parent who has her child's heart can help direct the child uh, to make wise decisions and go in the right direction. It's better to have a child who disobeys occasionally and you deal with it biblically, but you have their heart than to have a child who is compliantly obedient, but you don't have their heart because they have the potential to become a rebel and to do some horrible things. So here's a very important question. Do you have your child's heart? Grandparents, are you taking the time to invest in your grandchildren and have a relationship with them? What if you asked your kids, your grandkids, what would they say? Are you engaged? Man came to me many years ago. You, you don't know him. He came to me. He, uh, uh, he had just visited, and he wanted me to witness to his son, his married son. And so I'm just asking questions, and, and um, he said there had been a rift. I said, well, what was the rift, and have you resolved it? He said, no, we haven't resolved it. He said, the rift is, is my son married out of our race. I said, he did. I said, well, you know there's one human race. I said, who did he marry? He said, he married an Italian. (laughs) He married an Italian. And so I asked about the name of his grandchildren. He didn't know the names of his own grandchildren. You know what I said to him? I said, you get on your knees and you repent of your sin of prejudice. And you ask God to forgive you. And then you go to your son and you ask him to forgive you. And then you go to your daughter-in-law and you ask her to forgive you. And you get to know your grandkids. And then you come back, and then I'll go see your, your uh, son, witness to him. A few months went by, and he said, well, I, I went to another church, and I found someone else to do it. Rebellion is a heart problem. It's my problem, it's your problem. And a parent who has his child's heart can have influence. We need to know the Word of God and follow it. Now, here's a very important question. What would your son or daughter or your grandson or grandson say about your relationship with you? Okay, next. The one who has the child's heart will eventually have the child's love and loyalty. Your child will give their heart to someone. Your heart is not made to keep but to be given away. Whoever has the heart will have their love, their loyalty, and to influence them. Now you understand why God wants our hearts. He wants our hearts. And the world around us is trying to tie our children's hearts with everyone and everything except their parents. 
How many kids, their hearts are tied to the movie stars and the sports stars and the basketball and football stars, the cartoon figures and the musicians, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, but not the God. Would your child rather spend time with you than almost anyone else? Does your child listen respectfully when you speak? Do you have a desire? Do they have a desire to please you? Here's God's plan. It's that your child's heart be tied to you, and then they save their heart for the one they marry. They, you teach your child to keep their heart and bodies for the one they marry. Letter C. Children want parents to have their hearts. You say, oh, I, 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 no, no, this is how it starts. God built it into them. We all, all are born with the desire to please our parents, to be close to our parents, and to share things with them and get their praise and approval. And as children, we all hunger for it. We see it in the Bible. We see it with Esau we, in the book of Genesis. After the birthright was stolen by Jacob, Esau cries out, Bless me even also, my father. Don't you have one blessing for me? Absalom hungered for his father's approval. We ended the chapter, the previous one. Let me see my father. And if he wants to kill me, let him kill me. But I want to see my dad. We see it with David as well, hungering to see Absalom. One of Satan's big, big lies today is that some teen rebellion is normal. It's to be expected in every teenager. Every teenager at some time in their teen years becomes rebellious. Not, you just expect it. The answer is no. Rebellion is not normal, not in a child, not in an adult. It's sinful. 1 Samuel 15, 23. Rebellion is as the sin of, you know it, witchcraft. Witchcraft. It exposes a child's heart to demonic control. Even a little bit of rebellion is a sign to a parent that the child's heart is wandering and hungry for love and attention and acceptance. When a child has a sarcastic mouth to parents, you must not simply chalk it up and say, well, they're 16. A little bit of rebellion is like a fast-growing cancer, and it multiplies, and it becomes a massive destruction. Does this help you understand what we've been seeing on the news all summer long. It started in a home and a breakdown of relationship between mom and dad and children. When the riots start this week, and they shouldn't, but when the riots start this week, you remember this message. You remember last week's message. And the solution is is God's word and salvation coming to a heart, coming to a dad, coming to a mom, coming to kids, coming to a family. That's what our country needs. Money can't solve that problem. Politicians, government programs, conversations about our past can't solve that problem. Now, the ideal parent-child relationship, it is between God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. They are our example to be able to follow. You ever think about it? It's not Abraham and Isaac. It's not Isaac and Jacob. It's certainly not uh, Jacob and Joseph. The ideal example of the hearts of parents and kids being knit together is that of the Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. We find it in John 5, 19 and 30, 10, 30. I and my Father are one. We use it to refer that to the deity of Christ, but, it, but take, take it further. It's a view of the father-son relationship and the unity they have. Now, let's go here. There are three big dangers for the heart. Here's the order. The heart can be broken, the heart can be hardened, and the heart can be stolen. How do parents break their children's hearts? Well, how did, how did David do that? Well, he, he ignored the sin of Amnon. He got angry, but he did nothing, and that's how it started. Parents often lose their children's hearts by first breaking their hearts. And how do ch parents break their children's hearts? Well, by anger. And that's what David did, by anger. Anger crushes the child's spirit. For a mom and a dad to become angry, or again, you're older, your vocabulary is bigger, and you're more threatening in your demeanor. And to, to unleash a volcanic eruption upon your kids and they're going to take their heart and retreat. They're going to retreat like a, 
like, like, a, like a clam. Anger crushes a child's spirit. Dads, do you have a pattern of losing your temper? Once a day, once a week, once a month. Fear of explosions of anger can cause a child to retreat to a shell. Here, here's another one. By provoking your children to wrath, Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Uh, that is the most serious command given to parents because that is the only negative command directly given to parents in relation to their children. The most devastating consequences occur not from breaking positive commands, but from breaking negative commands. The Bible commands us to love our neighbor, and we should. The Bible also commands us, thou shalt not kill. Now, it's bad to break the positive commandment, not to love your neighbor, but it's horrendous to break the negative commandment and kill your neighbor. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Well, how do you provoke children to wrath? We're going to cover this in the parenting series. It's, it's criticizing or nagging. It's not properly disciplining. Is it spanking versus time out? You need to know what to do and when to do it. By raising the standard to get your praise and approval so high that they can't reach it, by comparing your child uh, to others, it provokes them to wrath. By making them do something they are terribly afraid to do, by not communicating enough with them, not spending enough time with them. You spend too much time on the sports and TV and hobbies and work. And by embarrassing them publicly. I know they do something and you take a picture and you just think, this is the funniest thing that I've ever seen and I can't wait to put it online and show my friends and family to get a laugh. Don't. Don't do it. You have. Don't do it. Do not embarrass your children publicly. And so, so that what that does is it breaks their heart. When they have a broken heart, to protect themselves, they make their heart hard. The children's heart is hard. We'll go to the next slide, which is really the, the heart is hardened. And how can you tell when a child's heart is hardened? It's true of grown children. Children become bitter. They, they just don't care if they have a relationship or not with their parents. And God can soften that heart as you pray for them. And after the heart is hardened, someone can steal that heart away. In teenagers, they simply turn to others. When King David did not listen to the needs of the men of Israel, in came Absalom, and he stole their hearts, just like wrong friends for kids today. Absalom listened, he talked, he touched, he stole their hearts. Here's the good news. The same things that can be used by parents to steal back the hearts of their sons and daughters from those who stole them away in the first place. So dads and moms, listen. Talk. Speak kindly to your children. Touch them. And if you listen closely enough to your children, you'll find what's hurting them, what's bothering them. Through wisdom is a house built by understanding it is established, and by knowledge, God's knowledge, shall the chambers of your house be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. Why do young people give their hearts to their friends? They listen to them. They talk with them. You're not going to raise godly kids based on how they look in the outside. And parents, if you think, well, you know, they're, uh, they're, the, the rules, the dress, the hair. No, no, no. What's going on in the inside is what's important. Oh, well, they're doing just fine. Are they doing fine on the inside? So you've got to reach deeper than that and talk to your son and ask him, hey, what do you think about this? And depending on their age, hey, what do you think are the three most important issues of the election? How do you feel about this? Does this bother you? What did you get out of the message in church today? How, how, how do you apply that when things don't go your way? How do you react and how do you respond? What are you reading in your Bible? What are you praying about? Talk. Ask questions. You study Jesus. That's what I love about the Chosen series. They come and they ask him a question. Many times Jesus doesn't give an answer. What does he do? He asks a question. We need to follow that model. The Lord, yes, he accepts you as you are, 
but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. Jesus said to the woman taken in adultery, what? Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn thee. So tonight, as we pray, let's pray for the heart, for people to be saved, for candidates and politicians and judges to be saved. Let's pray that our influence will spread. Let's pray that, that, again, as Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, if there be 50, if there be 40, 30, 20, 10, if there are just 10 righteous, will you spare judgment? And God said yes. And so really, it's on our shoulders now. It's on our shoulders. Let's pray. Let's do our part. Let's trust God. So let's go ahead, and, and uh, we're going to break down to prayer groups now. And so, young people, the children, children up to sixth grade, if you want to head to the art room back there, Brother Iomi is going.